Good morning and welcome to Redemption Hill Church. So glad you can join us online for this worship experience. We want to welcome you and thank you for being with us. We'd like for you to be able to interact with the service today. You can do so in the comments section. Also pinned to the top of the comments section, there is a connect card. And so we'd love for you to go to that, click on there, fill it out. Uh, let us know that you're with us today. Also, you can leave a prayer request there. We'd love to be able to pray for you throughout the week. If you're looking to be able to connect with a small group, you can go to our website and uh, check out all the uh, lineup for small groups, and uh, you would be able to directly communicate with the small group leader there. You can email them to find out the details of what they are doing with their small group. 
Also, as you know, as uh, we have gone through the pandemic, there's been a great need in our community to make sure that those uh, uh, who are facing food shortages have access to food. We're excited that here in the coming week, we're going to be able to partner with the Clemens Food Pantry. So stay tuned and check our Facebook page to see how you can participate in that particular outreach. And then as well, we do want to remember all of those who have given the ultimate sacrifice, dying in uh, military conflict so that we are able to secure our freedoms, to be able to free, uh, to be able to worship, and to be able to uh, uh, just pursue God freely. Um, you may not know this, but over 1.1 million service members have given their lives uh, in wars over the history of our country. So we want to pray and honor their sacrifice. And before we do that, I just want to read this quote from General George Patton, a World War II uh, general. He said this, he said, it is foolish and wrong to mourn the men who have died. Rather, we should thank God that such men lived. And truly, there is no greater sacrifice. Jesus said, there's no greater uh, love than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. So let's take a moment, remember those who have given the ultimate sacrifice uh, for our country, and then as well prepare our hearts for what we're getting ready to hear this morning. Pray with me, please. Father, we do thank you and we give honor to you. And Father, we thank you for those, Lord, who over the course of the history of our nation, who have given the ultimate sacrifice to dying in conflict in order, Lord, to secure our freedom so that we may enjoy the blessings of the, uh, that we may enjoy the blessings that we do today. Father, even in the midst, Lord God, of a pandemic, and Father, we trust you to continue, Lord God, to show yourself strong and faithful. But Father, we're so grateful that we live in a nation, Lord God, where we are free to worship. Where, Lord God, we can worship, Lord God, we can hear the word of God and be unhindered. We thank you, Lord God, for the ability, even in the midst of this time, Lord God, to be able to have the technology that is available in order to honor your name. We thank you, Lord God, that we are not limited by space or time. And Father God, that when we connect, Lord God, your spirit transcends place and as we join our hearts in unity, you are magnified. Father, we ask now that you would bless and anoint the rest of this worship service. Father God, we prepare our hearts to receive the word of God that you have for us today. Bless our pastor as he speaks. And Father, we receive your word today. We embrace it. And Father, we thank you for continuing to transform us by your grace. We give you honor. We give you praise and glory. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. I want to give you a quick update as we start uh, our time together in God's Word this morning. We are going through the book of Acts, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and we are in chapter 3 of the book of Acts, starting in verse 11 this morning together. But a quick update as we enter phase 2 in the state of North Carolina, Governor Cooper's phase 2 to kind of re-entry uh, into some sort of, of new normal and what that may look like over the coming days, months uh, that we go through in our city together. Um, I just wanted to update you and let you know that we are constantly uh, and earnestly in prayer as an elder team and leaders here at the church trying to figure out exactly what path that we need to take and what's wisest for us to do. And, and, and really, the, the, the thought is what is best to do for the glory of God and for the love of one another and the love of our city. And we want to walk in the wisest way that we possibly can. Uh, and so we want to kind of see what's going to happen in, in phase two. We know numbers of cases are still rising in North Carolina. And so we just want uh, to be safe. It, it's not a matter of, 
uh, of fear for not being able to worship God together or anything else. It's just a matter of love, and it's a matter of living out the gospel in the way that God calls us to. And so uh, we want to take our time. And so over the next couple of weeks, I know everybody's getting really tired of having to watch services online and, and not being able to see one another. Believe me, I, I guarantee you, I miss you just as much, if not more, probably more than you miss me. Um, and so I want to see your faces. We love you here at the church, and we love you enough to do what is best and most wise. And so over the next several weeks, this is where we will be, and we'll let you know and update you uh, as the wisest direction for us to take shifts and changes. So uh, we love you. We look forward to gathering back together with you, but this is where we will be for the next couple of weeks. Thank you guys for engaging. I know it's getting more and more difficult to do so, uh, and so we encourage you to continue uh, following along online and, and also being involved with small groups and really engaging with the body of Christ. So um, Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 11 through verses 26, and I'm going to pray for us quickly as you find that and we jump into God's Word. God, thank you so so much uh, for our time together this morning, and certainly on this Memorial Day, Lord, I, I don't know the names of all of those that, that Charles just mentioned, and, and I don't know the battle in which they fought and died, but God, you do. And, and God, we, we thank you for all that you have done for us to have freedom. We thank all of those who have sacrificed for us to be able to freely worship you. And on this Memorial Day, we pray for those who courageously lay down their lives for the cause of freedom. And God, we ask that it may be an example, that their sacrifice might be an example that inspires us a selfless love for your son and the selfless love of your son to reveal Jesus Christ in all that we do and the freedom that we have to worship him. God, we love you, and we give this time to you, and pray that everywhere around our city, our our state, our nation, the world, God, that your word is being proclaimed today, that you would add unto your church, and God, that you would build your people up. And so, God, we love you. We give you this time. We ask that everything that happens would glorify and honor you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to jump right in this morning for us. I I know if you were uh, paying attention last week or you were with us last week, that was kind of the introduction to what we're going to talk about today. It's kind of chapter three is kind of one story. And so if you like a really good introduction or at least a somewhat good or at least an attempt at an introduction to a passage, then you can go back and listen to last week's sermon if you have not done so already. Uh, But here's quickly where we have been as we've been walking through the book of Acts. Luke points out to to us that Jesus, God, has in fact become man, that he has come to earth, and that he does everything that is required for us to have salvation, to bring us back into communion with God, and everything that we long for can be found in him. In essence, Jesus is the hero, the savior, as we talked about last week, that every single one of us longs for. He came and he lived perfectly on our behalf and he did go to the cross as he foretold he would do, not only in his life, but in the book of Isaiah and other places, 700 years before he even came. After his death, he rises from the grave to give us new life that by grace we might be saved in him by placing our faith in the reality that he's done all the work for us to have salvation in him. And he told us multiple times in his life he would rise. And after he rose, he walked for 40 days around, and he taught us about his kingdom. He taught the apostles and disciples about his kingdom, and he performed miracles to reveal that he is the king of this kingdom that every single one of us longs for, and that he is bringing about everything that we long for in that kingdom, that one day he will make all things new, and one day every tear will be wiped away, and we will be with him as his people for all of eternity. And he tells his disciples before he ascends back into heaven that his work will continue through his people, not just the disciples, the followers, or the apostles, but also those who would come because he would send the power of the Holy Spirit that God would actually come and live and dwell inside of those who place their faith in him, that that he would live in and through them and give them the power to become more like who they were created to be and more deep in community with God and to reveal him to those who do not know him. 
And when he ascends, the Spirit does in fact come. And the Spirit begins to work boldly through the believers as they begin to teach about the kingdom of God that is to come and reveal uh, his hand through healing those around them to reveal that he is still working, that he is still living and active, and that Jesus is still saving, and that Jesus is still alive, and he is still working in his people, that all of his promises are true, and he is faithful to fulfill every single one. And so last week we saw the first of these miracles done through the apostles, a man who was actually crippled from birth. And we find out in Acts chapter 4 that he had been crippled from birth and he's over 40 years old. And so he has been crippled for a very long time. He has walked through life in the same exact way since his birth. And Peter and John are walking into the temple for prayer, the evening prayer time, of the three prayer times during the day, and they're intentionally walking with God. And so they're walking with one another. They are walking, being in God's word and, and going to him in prayer. They're, they're intentionally living missionally. They're intentionally living out the identity that God has given them. We fleshed that out last week. And they see this man who's calling out for help. And I, and I love how it says, and I just want to remind us quickly, that it says that they looked at him intently. They gazed upon him, and he looked back at them. And I just want us to be aware that as we are followers of Christ, and we have our identity completely satisfied in him, that we are who we are because of what Christ has done, and we do what we do because of who we are in him, then listen to me. We see the world in a different way. We see things that we never would have seen in ways that we never would have seen them outside of walking in God intentionally. And they see him and they introduce him to the healer and they introduce him to true healing that only Jesus can bring. And ultimately, we saw that the healing was not about the physical healing. It wasn't about taking care of this man for the rest of his life, though the church did do and the healing did occur. But it was ultimately not about his healing and taking care of his life in the physical sense, but his salvation and taking care of his eternity. That's what is pointed out here in Scripture. The physical act is revealing that the Savior is still at work that he is still saving, that his salvation is sure, and that he is working through his people. And so the question that we were kind of left with last week is, what just happened? Like, what on earth just took place? And the people are all gathering around asking the exact same question. Why did this happen? And what is next? What does it all mean? They want to know. And so they're gathering around this man and Peter and John asking these questions. And here's what Peter has to say. Well, look with me in chapter 3 of the book of Acts, starting in verse 11. Here's what God's word says. Right after his healing, he's leaping and jumping. He's, he's excited about what God has done. People are gathering. And it says this. While he clung to Peter, the man who was healed, and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them at the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though we in our power or piety, we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant, Jesus. So he's deflecting, he's pointing to Christ, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate. When he had decided to release him, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead, to this we are witnesses. Now that's pretty bold. And we're going to see throughout the book of Acts, this man Peter and those who follow Christ were not so bold before they knew him, before the Spirit came. But one of the characteristics of a believer, one of the characteristics of those who is walking and living in Christ intentionally in gospel community and in God's word and going to God in prayer that their hearts might be aligned with his, one of those characteristics that comes with that is boldness and the reality of who we are in Christ. Verse 16, and his name by faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance and did also your rulers. 
But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets and his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed to you, Jesus whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you, and it shall be every soul who does not listen to the prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who spoken from Samuel and those who came after him all proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets of the covenant that God made with the father, saying to Abraham, and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servants, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. So this is the kind of, we're, we're not seeing the ending of the story yet, but we're seeing the response to the healing last week as, as Peter responds to and gives us the answer to what's next. Like, why was this done, and what are we supposed to take from this, and how does this affect who we are, that Jesus is living and active, that he is still saving, that he is still working, that he is still working in and amongst his people, that he is still bringing pure and true healing and salvation, and that our eternity that we long for and community that we desire can be made known in him through his work by placing our faith in the reality that he's done the work for us to be saved. What next? And here's what we see, that just as the man has been healed, and he's leaped, and he has worshipped God, he's praising God for everything that has happened. He's really excited. And so as you can probably discern, if he's really excited, he's leaping, he's been in front of the temple with thousands of people walking by him. He has done so for a very long time. When he rises and begins to walk, it's noticed. When he starts leaping and worshipping, it's noticed. And so a lot of people are gathering together. What's going on? And in verse 11, this makes total sense to me. And I don't know if this is one of those words we just kind of skip right over and get to what we believe to be the meat of the text. But I think this word's important. It says, he clung to Peter and John. And I think a couple of things are happening there. One, I think, and one I know right here out of Scripture. Because you can imagine that as he has just been healed, he's leaping and worshiping and dancing and praising. Everybody is noticing and everybody is rushing them. Like this man wants to cling to Peter and John. Like you can imagine this happening. He's just thinking, I have never actually stood up before. I've never walked before. And quite honestly, I don't really understand everything that's going on here. I know who to thank and I know who to worship but I'm not really aware and sure of everything that just took place. And, and, and he needs to be close to those or desires to be close to those who, who understand because he doesn't quite understand. He wants to grow in an understanding of what has just happened in his life. And I can only imagine that he thinks to himself, if I do have some sort of sudden relapse, I want to be close to these guys. Like, these are my guys. Like, they just did something incredible. They are giving glory to God. Now, I am praising him, but I don't understand how to walk in this new life. I need to cling to those who do and can help me understand. That's one sense. But a deeper sense that we see right here, and it's very interesting in Scripture, as people come to faith in Christ, whether it be healing physically or mentally or out of a bad situation or addiction or false religion, whatever the situation which Jesus brings people out of every circumstance and saves out of every situation. Doesn't matter how bad it is, wherever you are in life right now, there is salvation and there is hope and there is new life. There is leaping and worshiping. There is joy in the reality of who Christ is. He saves from every circumstance. But when he does, they always and immediately, all throughout Scripture, those who place their faith in him, want to be with his people. They always cling to one another. You will find this all throughout Scripture, and you find it right here in this text. 
It's as if to say, okay, God has healed me. He has saved me. I have hope in him. I have new life in him. I have eternity in him. I have satisfaction in him. I have joy in him. And I know who to praise and I know who to worship. And I'm leaping and praising and and I am joyfully worshiping in gladness the God who has saved me and set me free. But I need help to understand this God deeper. I need help to walk in this new life. I need to lean on those around me that desire for me to know Christ in a deeper way. And listen, I just challenge you to think about this this morning. Because every single one of us clings to something. There's something that we're dependent on to help us walk through life. Even the most introverted of us, and I know that many of us, as, as the whole sheltering in place began to happen, we, we would post things on Facebook like, I was born for quarantine, like we are just introver- introverted, we, we desire to be by ourselves, but even those, even the most introverted of people, they cling to things. They need community. They cling to a people. They desire to be helped through life and and, and to walk through life with someone. It's super interesting. I've been looking at all sorts of stats, and we're not going to know really what's come of everything of of the shelter in place and the quarantine that we've been going through for the last several months for for some time now, but some stats are beginning to come out, and and, and I can share a bunch of those numbers, but just a, a story that I think just shares this perfectly, that all of us actually do this, is I was listening to a podcast several weeks ago, and they were talking about telemarketing companies who are making phone calls now and then reporting that they need uh, um, hotlines that they can send people to for counseling because they're calling these people. And for the first time in the history of telemarketing, these people are not trying to quickly get off the phone with the telemarketer, but they're trying to bend the ear of the telemarketer and the telemarketer is trying to get off the phone with them. And they don't know what to do with them. They don't ha- know how to talk with them. They're not talking about a product. They're talking about their life. Why? Because they just need community. They need someone to cling to and to lean on. We were created to have community and we were created to cling. And when we don't have it or when we have it, I would add in the wrong way, it shows. Nancy Lublin, the starter of the crisis text line, who's the largest counseling line in America, they speak to over 4,500 people a day. She just said over the last three weeks, Spousal abuse, child abuse, and substance abuse have risen over 6% in each of those categories. That's over 20 million people that are finding in isolation that isolation is inducing one of, if not the worst times of their lives. Why? Because we are ultimately made for community with God, and where it does not exist, disaster happens. This unity happens. Without gospel-centered community, without one another to cling to and to lean on, to walk in Christ together, there are idle thoughts that occur. There's no accountability. There's no process for us to help deal with our stress. We, we, wisdom begins to fall by the wayside as we're only talking to ourselves. And, and I would add, even when we try to walk together, when things are going quote-unquote normal and the people are trying to walk together but not in Christ, it leads to complete disunity. We actually walk away together from the one thing that we are chasing in all of life. And so our culture has revealed that wrong community doesn't lead to what we desire and that being isolated doesn't lead to what we desire. We were all created for community and God is the only one that can give us the community that we long for. But when he saves us, we draw together, begin to walk in him together. If we are not clinging to others who desire to follow God, who are heavily invested in you following Christ, and you are heavily invested in them following Christ, if you don't have that, then you will notice it in your life. And, and I say this, and I've, and I've kind of taken this little sidetrack to say this because I know that many of you are going through this right now. I've had conversation after conversation this week with so many who are struggling in this reality. And so just think about this for just a moment. Who are you clinging to? And why are you clinging to them? Is your isolation or the things that you are clinging to crippling you, or are they helping you leap and worship for the glory of God? 
Are they giving you life or are they taking life from you? See, this man has been healed and he knows that I need to be close to those who can help me thrive in my healing. And I just want to ask you, are you clinging to the people who can help you thrive in your salvation? Are you clinging to the people that will bring life into you, something of the divine into your life, that as you walk together, you're bringing something of the divine into those around you as we see here? Because as this happens in them and they're clinging and they're worshiping, something of the divine is revealed and the people gather. It says they gathered around them to see what is happening at Solomon's portico, a porch. It was the only thing that was left of Solomon's temple in the Old Testament. It was the only thing that the Babylonians did not destroy over 500 years before. And there was a porch there against the wall with a large gathering area. And it was in between the women's and the Gentiles' court. So everybody could gather there. And it was common for people to do so. And the first thing that Peter does as everyone is rushing to them. This is another reason it's so important for us to see that word. He clung to them because as everybody is rushing to them and wants to cling to Peter and John, they want to get close to Peter and John. I want some of what Peter and John are doing. I want to know who Peter and John are. I want to be close and cling to them. And the first thing that he does is to make sure they understand who they should be clinging to. And then it's not a person, but it is a God. It is a Savior. It is Jesus. And I love this. He, he deflects glory and he projects truth. He doesn't think to himself, wow, like I've never experienced this in life. I certainly didn't have this as a fisherman. I didn't have this when I was walking with Jesus. I was just in hiding in an upper room until the Holy Spirit came and filled me and gave me boldness to live out my faith for the gospel truth intentionally everywhere that I go. And now thousands upon thousands, we see in chapter four that 5,000 people come to faith after this message that Peter gives. So who knows how many thousands were there? Suddenly they're all rushing him and he could think to himself, this is extremely cool. That what an opportunity for me to gain 5,000 Instagram followers. What an opportunity for me to really boost up my own identity and to get glory and to have significant, significant place of prominence in our city. This would have been a great time for the early church just to go completely prosperity gospel. Silver and gold have we none, but if you give all of yours to us, then God will do for you what you want him to do for you. See, they could have easily made this like any other religion or philosophy that we follow in the world, this two-way street idea. That if you do this, then this will happen. If you work really hard, then this will come to you. If you do this for God, then God will do this for you. And we so easily get wrapped up in that, but that's not what Peter is going to proclaim. Because Christ is not just another worldview or religion where accomplishment precedes acceptance or achievement precedes approval and our performance equals our worth and our value. Listen, that is how the world turns, and outside of Jesus Christ, that is the cycle that you are stuck in, and listen to me, it's crippling. It's not freeing at all. You are enslaved to things that cannot save you, and you are following rules that will not work for you. But in Christ, we are saved by grace. It's Christ who does all of the work for us, and his life, his death, his resurrection, sending the power of the Holy Spirit that we might even walk in him that our inheritance is sure in him. He does everything. And that truth changes us because now I am who I am based on who he is, not what I do. I lack in nothing because he has already given me everything. When I place my faith in him and begin to walk in him, the spirit works in and through me. It's not up to me and my work for salvation or to impress God. It is God who has done all of the work and that is freeing. I can begin to just live in the identity that he has given me. I can begin to live out the way that he has created me to live, and that is freedom. So Peter says, no, it's not about man's glory. Like as soon as they start rushing him, he just completely just begins to push back. <laughs> Wait a minute. Like God, glory given to me, it is not even worth me entertaining for a moment compared to the joy that I have in giving glory to God. So just wait, just slow down. We did not heal this man by our power. It wasn't our piety. It wasn't anything we did or anything this man did to deserve it. 
but God healed this man. And he did so to reveal salvation in his kingdom, that he is still working and that everything he promised is happening and will occur. Yeah, God used us. And it's totally fine for them to kind of say, hey, Peter, John, thank you for, for, for being used by God, but, but it's not okay for them to worship. It's not okay for them to give glory to them. And so Peter deflects and he's like, yeah, like God did a miracle through us because he's still working through his people as he promised he would, but we're just tools in the hands of God. And he's basically just saying to them, listen, when you look at a beautiful garden, please, please, please do not worship. Do not worship the garden wreck, rake. When, when you're looking at a beautiful garden, don't, don't get really excited about the garden shovel. They're just tools, and you need to look to the creator and worship him. And so often in life, we look to things of creation, and we get really excited and worship them as though they are the ones who are in control, and they are the ones who created us to have what we long for, and we don't look to the creator. And so Peter just deflects, and he says, you need to look to Jesus. And he begins to explain what they just had experienced, which is extremely important. Because when we experience something, we need education on what we just experienced and what it means to proper, properly live and learn from that experience. If not, they could have just walked away. Peter could have done this, and he could have been thinking to himself, I've done this in the name of Jesus, but just allows everybody to walk away thinking maybe he did it or something else, and they could have worshipped, walked away and worshipped the apostles. They could have walked away and worshipped any number of gods that they would attribute to, well, maybe this thing did this, or maybe that thing did that, or maybe this god is what we should worship that did that. Maybe the man who was lame but can now walk is the one that we should worship. They could have walked away and worshipped any number of things. See, Peter's not just about healing the man. He's about real, revealing the reason that he was healed. He's about the gospel. It's all about Jesus. It's all about salvation. And everything that he does is a revealing of that salvation. But this happens all the time in our own lives. It might not be look exactly like this, but we experience something of grace and mercy from God. And then we just walk away and attribute it to, man, that was pretty lucky. We get a good gift, and then we kind of walk away and think, man, everything that I've been doing lately is really paying off. Some karma is coming back to me, and something really good is happening in my life because certainly I have been really good. We experience love, and we convince ourselves that our hearts have created the love that we feel. We experience beauty in creation, and we attribute it to created things. We experience some sort of satisfaction, and we attribute it to momentary things that fade. See, we do this all the time in our lives. We experience things, and without proper education of what we are experiencing so that we might live out through that experience the way that we are created to understand it and live the life that we are created to live, we just attribute it to all sorts of other things that we think of in our own finite minds, and we attribute the glory to that. We do it all the time. But Peter wants us to know the truth. He wants to explain what they have just experienced. And listen, I know that. I know that people in life typically just want to have one or the other. We're experienced people and we just want to experience things, or we are knowledge people and we just want to know things. We tend to fall to one of those two sides or the other, and the other one kind of scares us. I get it. It's very hard to live somewhere in the middle. Many of us just want to experience things. We love the goosebumps. We, we love the hair on our arms to stand up. We love to get our stomach in a knot. We like the thrill. So we are all about feel and emotion. And, and when we chase that, um, we, we get it and we think, man, everything's going really good. Hair on my arm stood up today. God is moving, right? I, I'm good. I'm, I'm close to God. Or it didn't happen. And so mm, things aren't really going that well. God seems to be very distant from me or whatever it may be in our lives. And so our perceived reality is determined by our emotions. These are the people that typically kind of feel like I just follow my own heart and whatever I feel I do because emotion is what stirs me. While others just want to have knowledge. I want to know the facts except separated from my experience because I really don't want my emotions to get in the way. They seem like something that keeps me from having true knowledge. And the danger there is that what we know never reaches our heart and affects the way that we live. 
So, so listen, we need, and Peter understands this, a miracle has occurred, and now he's going to explain the miracle to the people so that they know what to worship and they know how to live. Because we need in our lives both head and heart to work together, experience and knowledge as one. One example of this is what good is it to know what love is, the definition to a T, but not know how to live in it and reveal it? And what good is it to try to experience love to the best of your ability emotionally without understanding what it actually is? See, we need both of these things. God has created us to understand who he is and to experience him in community so that we know how to live and who we actually are. Because knowledge makes sense of our experience and experience reveals our understanding of knowledge. So Peter says, men of Israel, let me understand to you, you have uh, explained to you, you've just experienced something and you're amazed. And you're all gathering together because you're astounded at what you have just experienced. So let me give you the truth. And listen to me, church. This is the truth, the way, and the life. This is what Peter wants us to understand. And I need to say this as well because I know today that we struggle with the idea of ultimate truth. We do. We struggle with this idea of some sort of imposed truth on us by an ultimate God or ultimate truth giver. Many Christians, even today, who proclaim to be followers of Christ do not believe in much of what God's Word says. I'm not talking about just struggling with something God's Word says. We all should be doing that because all of us are sinful and none of us are perfect. And so some of the things God says we are not going to like right away. But are we working through it, and are we, is our belief in him, or are we just rejecting a lot of what he says? I'm, I'm seeing it all around us today from those who proclaim to follow Christ, just rejecting a lot of his truth. Because truth today is typically up to each person or maybe group to determine. It's very individualistic. And pretty much anything can be true for you as long as you don't, quote unquote, harm someone else's truth. In other words, you have to receive everyone's truth as truth today, which means ultimate truth doesn't really exist. There is no actual lawgiver. There is no imposed truth. There's nothing that we actually answer to. Now, Tim Keller and many others have said this very well, but he's pointed out, we know in life, we just live in this way that there is ultimate truth. We all live as though there is a common morality and expectation on others. We just can't figure out how to actually live in it. Jean-Paul Sauter, he pointed this out when he said, For those who do not believe God exists, for those who don't believe in a true truth giver or an, an imposed truth giver that we answer to, we are in trouble, he says, because morals are for us impossible yet unavoidable. And listen to me, that is a huge dilemma for us today, and it is demonstrated all over our culture. Madeline O'Hare, some of you may know who she is. She was an activist and founder of American Atheist. She said this, I gave up on the idea of truth, and the reason, she said, is the evil people have done in its name, which is a very common reason to not believe in an ultimate truth, to not believe in God. Um, the evil that happens, there's no lawgiver, there cannot be an imposed truth because of what truth has done, because of the people and what they've used it for. Her idea is, I'm so offended by the truth that people have declared that I've just given up on it altogether. I don't know, listen, if you caught what she just said, but it makes Saltaire's point perfectly. I don't believe in truth because the truth disgusts me. That's what she says. And O'Hare ends up actually affirming ultimate truth that is innately in us all in her denial of truth. And this happens all around us today. Because you only get disgusted with the truth people proclaim if you think to yourself, those people should know better than that. So not only is she affirming truth, but she's affirming truth written on our hearts, which we know God actually creates us with. See, you can't truly live out a worldview of creating your own truth. You'll always contradict yourself and your created intent, what God has put in every single one of us. So listen to me, ultimate truth does exist. I wish we had more time to dig into this this morning, but it does exist. We all live as though it does. And, and here's an important part that we need to understand. Ultimate truth is imposed on us. 
or it's not ultimate truth at all. It matters who's imposing the truth. Only God's truth is the truth that allows us to thrive and live in, but ultimate truth is imposed, or it's just what we think and determine by our own interpretation of experience, which is so limited. There's nothing worthy of this but God and the one who created us to know him. And so Peter says, let me make sense of your experience. This is so important. By relating, here's what he does, Jesus, who is like no other, who is God and the truth, and we'll, we'll finish up on that in just a moment, to his word, his truth that glorifies him, he says in verse 13, that we might gain the needed knowledge of our Savior and King. So he says to those at the temple who know the Old Testament, they, they understand the scripture. He says the Old Testament prophecies of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and others, the scriptures, they are not words about God. Here's what he's laying out for them here. These are not words about God, a God that was created by man that we are to serve and hope that he will do something for us like any other philosophy or religion that we may follow. These are the words of God, the truth giver, the one who gives us the truth that we are to thrive in, that we are to find life in, that we have salvation in. Then he actually came to serve us. He's different than any other God. And they tell us, he says, these scriptures of our Savior, the Messiah that we have been waiting on, the hero that we all long for, the one who makes all things new, the one who takes away and heals us from everything that is destroying us. Jesus, the Christ, the one who came and lived and died, he is what we are looking for. He is what we long for. And this is so important because we don't read scripture and say, that's what Isaiah said and that's what Paul said. Or that's what Peter said, but that is what God says. Therefore, it's not just some idea from some people for some time about God that we have to kind of weed through and read and think to ourselves, is this still true for us today? Was it true for Peter when he was preaching it? We don't have to discover the truth through our experience, but the truth is given to us by God who came and he gives it to us through his word. And he is the God who is eternal and unchanging, which allows us to experience the life that we were intended to live. And his truth is always truth. We do not have to take a vote. It tells us about Jesus. Jesus came and lived and died and rose. He ascended. He sent the Spirit. He's still alive and working through his people today. And we see an example of it right here in Acts chapter 3. And that's what Peter's saying. It's why Peter says in Scripture in Acts chapter 2, that we're doing this because the scripture must be fulfilled. Because it's truth. What it says will happen. What it says must happen. It's why Jesus often answers questions in his life to the Pharisees and other religious leaders and even to the disciples. It is written. And then he quotes scripture. It's why he often says that this has happened, that scripture may be fulfilled. It's why when he's hanging on the cross, he quotes scripture. Because scripture is who he is. And listen to me, when you're hanging on the cross and you're in that type of situation, you're not thinking about what to say. Who you are just comes out. And as God hangs on the cross, the truth of who God is comes out. And guess what it is? It's scripture. See, we know God and believe all of his word. And this is the way that we have to look at at scripture. For his word is who he is. We've said so many times his word and his actions are the same because he is truth. And he displays his truth to us in his word. And it's vital that we see the Bible this way. Because we don't go to the Bible and say and and think this is what we may need to believe. Or this is what maybe they were talking about. or, Or certainly in our culture things are different than it was then. No, we can believe it all. Because the words of scripture are the words of God and his actions and his words are the same. And so even when Jesus is living out the life that that only he could live, the things that he says and the things that he poses and the, the words that he uses are that of scripture. Why? Because his word is his truth. His word is his character. 
And if we don't acknowledge that, then we're saying to ourselves, I I want a God who cannot contradict how I interpret my experiences. If we go to God's word and say, I'm going to figure out what I want to believe and what I don't, then basically we're just saying, I want a God that can't contradict me. And if you don't have a God who can disagree with you and you will follow, then all you have is you and you fall short. If you don't have a God that can tell you bad news and you will still believe, then you don't have a God that you can believe when he tells you good news. And listen to me, that destroys the gospel. It kills grace, it kills our hope, and it leaves us in some form of worldview or religion that's dependent upon our work, done for selfish gain. Because all religion and all worldviews outside of Jesus, the object of the faith is actually you, not some other God. You're the object because you determine what rules you need to figure out and what rules you need to live in, and then you live in them as hard as you possibly can to deserve something from something else. It's all about you, and your experiences will determine your hope, and your experiences are very limited. Your understanding and your knowledge cannot be determined truthfully in just your experience. You need education. You need knowledge of why you experience what you experience. You need to understand who God is. So really quickly, Peter pulls scripture and Jesus together, and he says to the people, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who pointed to Jesus, he is the truth. He is the one that you're looking for. He is the word that we need to know. And when we worship anything else, seeking ultimate truth anywhere else, we effectively do what they did physically and spiritually. As he says to them very boldly in front of a huge crowd of people who just killed Jesus a few weeks before, he says, you denied and killed the one that you long for. See, when we walk away from Jesus for any other thing, we walk away from the author of life. We walk away for what, from what we are actually searching for. We walk away from the truth that makes, it, makes all of our experiences understandable and makes sense. We walk away from the truth that defines who we are and gives us the identity that we need to live as we were created to live. And he says in verse 17, I, I, I know that you didn't know what you were doing. I know that it was our desire to do that, but it was ultimately God's plan For he said he would come as the suffering servant. We see this in verse 18 here and also back in verse 13. Probably referring back to Isaiah chapters 40 through 66. That he became the only God who serves. And this is amazing evidence of everything that we just said for the truth of scripture. Because there is not a God like this God. He is the only one who is like this. Just look for something else to worship or to find truth in. Like this God, I promise you will not find it. See, worldly things and religious views of God are are man-made things to worship and man-made religions to follow for something. They do not help you determine truth and make sense of your experience, but they are made in the image of your experience and what you perceive through them to be true. And we only create them like that, a God that we serve, and we have to do all of the work for it and make ourselves the center of our faith because in our sin, we want to be God. And for us to find what is lacking in our lives, we feel like we have to get power and we feel like we have to be served and we feel like we have to gain something. And so every God that we make, we make in our own image. We make a God who expects us to do certain things and that expects us to worship him for power and expects him to give him certain things that he so he will do certain things for us in hopes that we will have salvation that we were all created for to only have in Jesus Christ. But the true God isn't like that. The true God has no insecurity in his power or authority. He has not made in the image of man, but he made man in his image. He lacks nothing and nothing can be taken from him. He can give all that he has and still eternally be full of all that he has given. He is so in control and in charge that his godness isn't in jeopardy when he comes down to live humbly, to live poor, to have no home, to have no wife, to have no children, to have no money, effectively crippling himself so that we can can rise up and walk by his grace and his work, knowing that we cannot live up to his standard and and all that he requires for us. He lives up to it for us. See, only in Christ do we get the verdict before the performance. 
He's the only one who doesn't say, pull it together before I will love you and reward you. He is the only one that doesn't demand for the lame man to do better before he can enter into the temple. In his presence, we can rise up and walk by his power, by his work, through his grace. And we can begin to live in his truth as we were created to live. See, Jesus is the key to your life. He's the key to everything that you want and everything that you were created for and everything that you long for. And only in his name, Peter says, can you be healed. Can you be saved? Can you be set free? And Peter closes by saying, Jesus, to these who would know the Old Testament, Jesus is the better Moses who leads his people into the promised land of his kingdom where there will be no pain and all tears will be wiped away. True healing will occur. He's the better king in verse 24, who's in the line of King David, who David only pointed towards. He's the king that we all desire and long to serve. He's the better Abraham, for in Christ every nation will be blessed. And in him, no matter where you are from and no matter what you have done, you can be saved and you can be made new and you can be his sons and his daughters by his grace. So verse 19, repent. Repent and be saved. Repent from the things that you are putting above him. Repent from the things that you are worshiping. Repent from not understanding who God is and, and allowing your experiences to be defined by, by who he is and what he has done. It says, repent of your sin, your crippledness, your brokenness. Let it be blotted out. Let it be erased completely. And I love this. For the time of refreshing to occur. Do you need refreshing in your life? Like this word is, is, is used to, to give an example of a cool breeze. It's the same word that was used in Exodus to describe the ending of the plagues on the people of Egypt. That it's like everything has come to a close. A cool breeze comes and ah, I can rest. The hardship is over. The healing has come. Salvation is here. I no longer have to work and seek for my salvation because it's given to me like a cool breeze because the work is done by God himself. And at the end of this sermon, we see in chapter four that 5,000 people come to faith. Why? Because every time that scripture is preached, Jesus is preaching. His word is his truth and it is living and active. His work continues through his people. It is an unending movement. God, thank you so much for our time together this morning. And God, I, I just pray that right now, where, wherever we are, wherever we're listening, any of those that would listen later, God, I pray that you would just move in our hearts. I pray that you would just reveal yourself to us. God, I pray that you would impress upon each individual exactly how they need to move in you. I pray that you would you would overwhelm them with your presence and your spirit, and those who don't know you would give their life to you even right now in this moment. And those of us that do, I pray that we would focus on you and your truth, and that would begin to define our experiences. God, we, we love you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the
could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Uh, let me encourage you to uh, get connected this week with uh, us here at Redemption Hill Church. Uh, you can go to our website, redemptionhill.net, to find out more information about uh, the church and to, again, like Charles was saying earlier, uh, find a small group that is uh, that you can jump into right away. Uh, we want to pray as we end our time together, uh, but let me just encourage you that uh, in this time, as we are all making decisions, as we are all uh, figuring out what it looks like for us to go back, that, that we would heed the words that we've heard this morning, that, God, that whatever we would do, that God would be at the center, and that it would be His power working in and through us, that we would see ourselves as instruments in His hands, 
and that we would believe that he desires to use us for his glory. So that's my prayer for you this week, that God would use you in whatever capacity or whatever circumstance you find yourself in, and that you would have boldness to proclaim his glory uh, wherever it is that you find yourself. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today that you've given us. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come into this place and to worship you freely. And God, we do not take for granted those who have made the sacrifice of their lives for our freedoms. So God, we thank you that we can come here and we thank you that we can sing praises and pray to you knowing that you hear us. God, we're so thankful for your word this morning. We thank you for uh, hearing it. That God, we would take what we have heard this morning and that we would diligently search the scriptures and that we would find that, God, you are at work. You are at work in the book of Acts. You are doing great and mighty things. And God, you are at work today using your people just like you always have. And so, Father, for us, I pray that you would send us out into the places where we find ourselves in power, that you would empower us by the Holy Spirit, even if that is that you are just sending us to another week at home. God, I pray that we would have supernatural power in our homes this week, that God, you would heal relationships, that God, you would strengthen your people, that God, you would change lives through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you that, God, you are at work in our city. God, we pray this morning for La Roca Church. We pray for their pastor, Nestor Gudino. God, we pray a special blessing over that whole community. God, over that body of believers as they are ministering. God, as you are using them. And Lord, we pray a blessing also over Redemption Hill Church, that, God, you would Use this body of believers for your glory. And Lord, we know that it is not our hands that, that complete the work, but it is you, you working in and through us. So Father, would you, again, God, just use us. Lord, we love you, and we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Redemption Hill Church, you are sent.